call the meeting to order. We got the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Otter, can I call on the roll, please? Ms. Wilson? Here. Mr. Norris? Here. Ms. Bees? Here. Mr. Morris? Here. Ms. Wager? Here. Mr. Thompson? Here. Mr. Loudermilk? Here. Thank you. Uh, moving on, we have corrections to the journal of the preceding meetings if needed. Uh, first up, the December 8, 2020 meeting. review the minutes of that meeting and if there are any corrections I'd ask that you point those out at this time Mr. Efner, uh, how would we be best to proceed here since there was only three current members that were in that meeting? Fair enough. Any questions or corrections to the journal of December 8th, 2020 meeting? If there are none, I'd entertain a motion. Council. I second. Okay. Motion on the floor by Councilman Thompson, second by Councilwoman Wager. If there are no further comments or questions, I'd ask for roll call vote, please. Ms. Thies? Aye. Mr. Morris? Aye. Ms. Wager? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Loudermill? Aye. Motion carries. Next, we have before you the January 5th, 2021 meeting minutes. I'd ask you please uh, address any corrections, any concerns or comments you may have at this time. And if there are none, I'd entertain a motion to accept. So moved. Second. We have a motion on the floor by Councilman Thompson, a second by Councilman Morris. If there's no further comments or discussion. Ask for roll call vote, please. Ms. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Norris? Aye. Ms. Dees? Aye. Mr. Morris? Aye. Ms. Weger? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Loudermill? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to public comment. We have Mr. Art Fuller here with the Hamilton Center to give us a presentation. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are delighted to be here on behalf of Hamilton Center to share some information with you this evening about a new federal grant that we think would really be of great service uh, to the Vigo County community. Uh, my name is Art Fuller. I'm the project director for the federal grant. 
And uh, we are here with the team, so they're going to be at how it can really just best help. Uh, start off with is our struck on a weekly basis. That 19 member team has three co captains. I'm one of the co captains related to government coordination, so that's having to do with all the reporting requirements. Uh, there are semi annual reports that are describing the implementation along with data. And then our chief clinical officer, Mark Collins, is also a co captain. At this time, I'm going to have him explain uh, his portion associated with the grant. Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us. On behalf of our CEO, Mr. Burks, we appreciate what you said. My name is Mark Collins. I'm the chief clinical officer for the Hamilton Center. I've been with the center for 17 years. I've been the chief clinical officer for almost four years. My role, <clears throat> excuse me, in the CCBHC is very simple. My job is to operationalize everything we do with this grant. In Vigo County, I also oversee all of our clinical services in all 11 counties that we serve in West Central Indiana. So my job is fairly simple. Make sure it works, make sure it's efficient, make sure it serves the consumers in Vigo County. Uh, we plan to implement all three of the goals you're gonna hear about later on this evening. Uh, we have implemented all three of these goals that will provide services that are unique to Hamilton Center and unique to Vigo County. Uh, and it will assist with some of the continued issues that you hear about regarding incarceration, regarding police reform, regarding servicing those with uh, substance abuse issues. So in short, my role, make sure. We also have another co-captain himself. Um, this proposition, so we have 31 on carrying out the duties associated um, with disciplines that range from uh, psychiatric nurse practitioner, registered nurses, uh, master's level clinicians, therapists, um, peer recovery specialists, access specialists who help with placement and hospitalization of consumers that may need that, um, a project director, a project and this first year, we uh, currently we have five open positions of the 31, um, and so 26 positions onboarded uh, that we've been able to train and help us work within the three goals of our uh, project. And so you'll learn more about the, the teams and the various duties of the positions, but I'll just touch briefly on the three goals associated with this project for the position. So the first goal was to increase our access facility to a 24-hour uh, seven days a week facility and uh, make it a mobile crisis unit. So we have 14 positions that we onboarded um, to enhance that unit. Uh, the second goal was to create what's called an uh, ACT team, an assertive community treatment team. And so we onboarded 10 positions with that goal. And our third goal was primary care screenings to make sure um, all consumers that come through receive the primary care services that they need or are receiving them have a primary care physician or primary care provider, and if not, we connect them to our newly established uh, federally qualified health center, uh, which is just down the way from uh, in our main center uh, called Grace Clinic. So um, 31 positions is, is what we've been awarded and been able to increase here in the Wabash Valley with this project uh, and carry out the services uh, for our community. So thank you all again for having us. And so, as you'll remember, I referenced we have a 19-member team that meets on this on a weekly basis. The thing I'd like to emphasize, so each of us three co-captains, we meet with our CEO every single weekday at 7.30 a.m., and we give him an update on progress related to the grant. Uh, the, there are two key positions in the grant. One is the project director, is there are quarterly so that's what that stands for. Stacey Totten, I'm the manager of recovery service, passed into legislation in 2014. There's nine criteria as well as the screenings and intensive community-based mental health care. Our emphasis relies on those 24-hour crisis care services, evidence-based practices, and coordination of care. Funding for, or I'm sorry, funding started in 2016 through the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. Um, CCBHC over we applied for the grant nine nine million we identify model there's currently over 200 CCBHC's operating in 33 states 66 are operating in eight of the original demonstration states 
There are six organizations in Indiana that are funded by that 2020 grant. They're Centerstone, Porter Stark, Four County, Community Mental Health Center, Good Samaritan, and Hamilton Center. A demonstration state is one of the eight states designated by the Health Resources and Services Administration as a medically underserved area, medically underserved population, or mental health professional shortage area. The states identified as demonstration states qualify to receive a PPS or prospective payment system, which is a clinic specific encounter paid monthly or daily uh, to reimburse the cost of services for the CCBHC model. The Center for Medicaid Services provides the technical assistance to determine the PPS rates. Indiana is not a demonstration state, so in order to execute that model financially, we will use the services from the Medicaid, I'm sorry, yeah, the Medicaid Rehabilitation Option or MRO. So as I mentioned before, that federal oversight is through SAMHSA. All of that communication flows through our CEO, Melvin Burks. Um, our designated representatives are Grant Chief, Commander David Berry, Grant Program Officer, Ogechi Jubrila, and Grant Management Specialist, Anna Pham. Our CEO has several roles within this grant. He is responsible for maintaining a fully staffed management team to meet the needs of the CCBHC grant. He's also the business official, which is the person responsible for attesting and signing all the forms, uh, making sure they are accurate, and making, making sure that we are meeting those requirements. He's also the organize, organize, sorry, authorized organizational representative. That is a mouthful. Um, he's the person responsible for submitting the application and responsible for completion of the institution registration form. We are part of the National Mentorship Program. We were accepted into the National Mentorship Program for CCBHCs, which is sponsored by the National Council for Behavioral Health. So being a part of that, uh, that focuses on peer-to-peer -peer insight for education on CCBHCs, also expanding knowledge and improving practices. Newly awarded CCBHCs are paired with an experienced CCBHC, and we were paired with a Kansas City, Missouri CCBHC called Tri-County Mental Health Services. Our first meeting was held on August of last year, and those meetings occur at least bi-monthly. I am going to speak to you tonight about our specific goals within the CCBHC and how we plan to expand services um, aside from what we already offer with the Hamilton Center. The first goal, which Brock talked to you a little bit about earlier, is the increase of access services in the mobile crisis unit. So we've always had our access service center where we can take in individuals who are in need of a higher level of care, correct? But moving forward, what we're doing is we're ensuring that these individuals who work in the access center are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're utilizing evidence-based practices, including motivational interviewing. And then additionally, we have the mobile crisis unit. So we're able to go out and meet individuals who may be in crisis where they are in the community and determine the most appropriate pathway to care. Do they need hospitalization? Do they need psychiatric hospitalization? Or is it something that maybe we can address in the community and have them follow up with outpatient services? Goal number two is to improve the access and coordination to intensive community-based services for adults with serious mental illness. So this is our assertive community treatment team. Now, the Vigo County Adult Services team had in the past worked with individuals who are in need of that high intensive care with our ICT team. Now we're moving to assertive community treatment, which is an evidence-based practice, which involves about 12 different practitioners, again, which Brock mentioned some of the positions earlier. And what we do is we wrap services around those most severely mentally ill individuals so that they can still interact and live their lives in the community while receiving services such as nurse practitioner services, RN medication management services, daily or weekly counseling services, and then skills and case management as well. Goal number three of the three-pronged approach is to improve the coordination of care through increasing our primary care screenings. Now, as many of you know, working in the community, oftentimes individuals who have a behavioral health issue do not take care of themselves physically as they should. 
Um, so what we're doing is every single person that walks in the door at the Hamilton Center for an intake, we're completing a primary care screen. We're asking them questions about their health care. Do you have a primary care physician? What medications are you taking? Are you compliant with those medications? Do you need assistance and or resources that we can assist you with? So what we're doing with each and every one of those individuals, screening them and then linking them to the resources that they need, kind of getting ahead of those things in collaboration with their behavioral health care. Now, Art talked to you about the three, three subcommittees, okay? First, we're gonna talk about the government coordination subcommittee, which Art was our leader. Um, the individuals who are listed here were also partaking in the planning portion of this, of this committee. What our focus was to ensure that Hamilton Center meets all of the criteria for federal and state regulations. And I'll go through some of that criteria here in just a bit as well. The second subcommittee, which was Mr. Collins' subcommittee, is the operationalized subcommittee. Um, you can see the team members, again, listed here on the screen. They focused on the three areas of the goals that I just explained to you. The primary care screenings, the expansion of the 24-7 crisis services, and then the developmentation of the ACT team. What his subcommittee did was split into three different subcommittees as a whole. The first being the primary care screening work group, which was Mr. Collins and Ms. Sade Denton. Their tasks and focuses include looking for options for um, primary care screenings. They wanted to research the reimbursement rate if we could find one. Look for different screenings to be utilized so that we can glean the most information from the patients who are coming through our doors. Um, assisted in really working with our electronic medical record to make those systems work for us. And then monitoring the goals. Where are we gonna be? How many individuals are we gonna be able to physically serve through this goal? The second subcommittee was the 24-7 Access and Mobile Crisis Unit, which was um, headed up by Ms. Emily Owens and Mr. Shannon Jackson. And they really built this from the ground up. We did a lot of work here identified evidence-based programming so that we can train those individuals who are working that 24-7 access department. Working with access to develop policies and procedures for the mobile crisis unit, not only to ensure the safety of the individuals who are going out to meet the individuals in the community, but those that are being served as well. Developing a staffing plan to ensure that we have coverage for that access center. And then interviewing and assisting with filling those positions of individuals who will be serving. And then what criteria are we looking for for folks who we are gonna go ahead and, and move the mobile crisis team to serve within the community? The third area is the assertive community treatment group. And this is Mrs. Mandy Adams Washburn and Natasha Newcomb. And they worked in collaboration with myself and my department because all of the individuals work in Vigo County outpatient at our main facility. We developed a staffing plan to assure we have coverage 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We created policies and procedures. We looked at the admission criteria. What type of folks are we looking for to serve with this ACT, ACT team? Are we looking to refer maybe for internal services or people who are walking in the door? We developed an assessment process, interviewed individuals, and then also identified those consumers who may be appropriate for the ACT team as well. So Brock talked to you a little bit about the position subcommittee earlier. We were able to hire 21 staff or implement 21, sorry, 31 new positions for the CCBHC grant. What we did as a team, um, we each had a few positions and resumes that were coming in. We were part of the interview process and we ensured that the individuals that were being hired knew about the CCBHC grant and what was expected of them. We also needed um, individuals who were able to work holidays, weekends, and overnights. So as a positions team, we met weekly and also were in constant communication with those hiring managers to ensure that those individuals were hired into those 31 positions. As I stated earlier, I would talk to you a little bit about the criteria which is involved to meet the needs for this grant. Um, not only as we are initiating and starting up, but moving forward through the next two years as well. Appendix M is a document that is basic criteria that needed to be met one way or another through policy procedure changes or 
alteration. We did find that a lot of the criteria we were either meeting or just had to make minor tweaks to our current policies and procedures to be able to move forward with the criteria. I'm going to go through some of the general areas so that you can get a feel for the criteria in Appendix M. The first is the general staffing requirements. We looked at a community needs assessment. We have a clinical staffing pattern and the composition of those individuals as well, management staffing pattern as well, and then cultural competency, the skills and the training of our staff. The second area was the availability and accessibility of services. So are we compliant with all relevant federal, state, local laws and regulations regarding the client and staff safety, cleanliness, and accessibility? Our access to services, the availability to come in and have a timely evaluation and screening, the person-centered treatment planning, and then the provision of our service line. Care coordination, we looked at holistic care, our health information tools, care coordination agreements, community partnerships that we already had, and maybe where, where we needed to enhance those community partnerships as well. And then treatment team planning and our current treatment team compositions. We looked at the scope of services, and Stacy talked to you at length about that earlier. But our general service provision, person-centered care, behavioral health screening, assessments, diagnosis, substance use services, primary care services, peer support, and military veteran services. We looked at our quality and other reporting. We looked at data collection. What are we looking to collect and what are we going to do with these outcomes? We really wanted to um, seek out that data collection right from the start, make sure that we have our reports to run, that we can pull it right up from our electronic medical record and be able to report to the state timely. The organization authority, governance and accreditation. We looked at the organizational authority, our board of directors, and how we can meet the needs, the accreditation, and an annual financial audit. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the benefit, not only to the community, but the consumer specifically. We have patient, patient and family-centered care, the access to services, expansion of access to services, not only with our evidence-based practices, but also the service line becoming that 24 hours for crisis and intensive community treatment. Holistic care, following the patients through their behavioral health needs and also primary care and linking to resources that maybe Hamilton Center doesn't offer at all. Care coordination, the quality of those services provided and the diversity. This is the telephone number for access services if you ever find yourself where you have somebody that might be in need of that mobile crisis unit, that might be in need of that higher level of care for, for intensity um, within the community, please feel free to reach out to this 1-800 number. And then beneath that here you'll see, and also on your PowerPoint presentation, is the direct contact for Mr. Fuller, where you can make direct referrals as well. Thank you. Yes, so that concludes our presentation. We really do want to emphasize the 800 number there for the general uh, community, for those in need. We're excited about the opportunities this grant, uh, grant provides and open up to any questions. But how, do you, how are you going to, oh, I, I don't know, for a better terminology, advertise that this is out there for the folks? Yes, I mean, so one thing that we're actually working on now uh, we have actually been meeting with our local law enforcement authorities and so we are we're working on ways that we actually get this out into the community we're working on uh, an official kind of ccbhc public service announcement right. or commercial or things like that uh, but we really want to emphasize the community partners that are involved in that so right. those are at, we're working on that uh, literally as we speak right thank you Is, is it up and running now? Yes. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry, it is. Sorry. I say that was an emphatic. Yes, yes it, so, is. it was very emphatic. Uh, so uh, our, our first service was delivered on, uh, I believe, August 28th. Okay. Do you, is there a, um, like, age limit or do you work with youth that oh, that, crisis that, as well? That is an excellent question. So this is for both children and adults. 
And uh, so I'm very glad that you asked that question with the services and even with the goals. So you know how we talked about the primary care screenings? We have specific goals for uh, this primary screenings for children and adults, so yes. Does this come, uh, is it comprehensive for like alcohol abuse and, and drug substance abuse? Yes, so this is, uh, I think the great way to think about it is we're trying to serve as a central hub to coordinate care, whatever the need happens to be. Uh, so whether that comes through primary care screenings, then we can connect them with primary care physicians, providers, if there's more behavioral health needs. So really look at it as a way to welcome people who need help and support and service, irregardless of what that help is around. Thank you. Yes. Any further questions or comments from council? Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank right you, here, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, communications from elected officials, other officials, or agencies of the county. I believe we um, have some information uh, before us regarding uh, some concerns with one of the council rules. Anyone, does everyone have that information in front of them? The I amendment? Yeah. It's stated at the top, amendments to the rules, February 9th, 2021, Rule 7. Um, I just would ask that Mr. Efner just kind of speak on that briefly as to some of the information he's learned here recently and um, how that might impact this rule that we have. These are basically changes that were brought about based on changes to the rules in regard to the Sunshine Meeting. And uh, these proposed additional changes are basically set forth to assure compliance with the open door law and the requirement for publication 10 days prior to a public hearing regarding appropriation or so uh, we've attempted to streamline the process I guess with the sunshine meeting by making the sunshine meeting the, the vehicle for first meeting so uh, in order to allow discussion and, and particularly in regard to appropriation ordinances 10, 10 days before, since they're going to be discussed at the Sunshine Meeting, um, we're going to ask that the um, request be filed 15 days prior to the Sunshine Meeting. Uh, and the rest of it just follows, follows the same line of thinking in order to accomplish Any questions from council regarding that? I it should be an amendment, a separate document. Do not receive that. And, and for the two newest members, this is uh, a rule contained within the council rules that was um, presented and approved by the council in the January meeting. If there are no questions, um, I guess First of all, if we would like to amend Rule 7, we would have to have uh, such a motion. So, so, mo so moved. To amend and then um, provide amended language from there. I'll move that we approve the amendment to Rule 7 of Council Rules. So is the motion 
to amend House Rule 7? Yeah. Motion to amend? Yes. Okay. So there's a motion on the floor to make an amendment to Council Rule number 7 by Councilman Morris. I'll second it. There's a second on the floor by Councilman Norris. And again, this is just to amend the rule. There's no further questions or comments. I'd ask for roll call vote, please. Ms. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Norris? Aye. Ms. Thies? Aye. Mr. Morris? Aye. Ms. Wager? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. So now I'd ask for uh, proposed amended language to rule number seven. So whoever would like to enter in what is going to be amended in Rule 7, the actual language to be amended. How do you want me to phrase that? Just yeah. move to approve I, I amended Rule 7? I'm afraid. Hold on. We can do it that way. Why, why don't we go ahead and amend Rule 12 and then adopt the rules as amended? There. I would, I would suggest a motion to amend Rule 12 pursuant to the amendment rules February 9, 19, 20, or 21, which So you want me to say, I make a motion to approve Rule 12? To amend Rule 12. I, I, I think before we do anything, we need to That's rescind the, the last motion. Okay. Correct. Okay. Withdraw it. Yeah. So you want me to withdraw? Yes. I withdraw. Okay. Okay, now moving on to 12. Moving on to 12, I would suggest a motion to amend Rule 12 uh, as set forth in the amendment rules dated February 9, 9, 2021. So moved. I'll, can I just say that? Yeah. So we have a motion on the floor by Councilman Morris, a second by Councilman Wilson. There's no questions or comments. I'd ask for roll call vote, please. Ms. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Norris? Aye. Ms. Dees? Aye. Mr. Morris? Aye. Ms. Weger? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Loudermilk? Aye. Motion carries. Well, I think you seven has been amended. That was the motion to amend seven, right? Is that what we did? This was just 12. First? I thought that was. Okay, that's good. Then we can make the same motion in Yes. I make a motion to amend Rule 7, as stated by Mr. Effner. And that would reflect the amendment presented to full council tonight, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. We have a motion on the floor to amend Rule number 7 as presented to full council tonight. And that is the handout that you've received. Is there a second? Second. Motion on the floor by Councilman Norris. A second. No further questions or comments, I'd ask for roll call vote, please. Ms. Wilson? 
Aye. Mr. Norris? Aye. Ms. Dees? Aye. Mr. Morris? Aye. Ms. Weger? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Loudermilk? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Are there any further communications from elected officials? I would like to address the council. Yes. Councilwoman Thies. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize the service and impact of John Robert, otherwise known as Bobby Turner. Um, recently, I saw an outpouring of condolences and tributes from people in the community. I've known his daughter, Nikki Reardon, and her family for some time through her own children and um, school. So I reached out to, to learn a little bit more about how long he had served as a volunteer firefighter in northern Vigo County. I was amazed his service goes back as far as the 1970s when he started work with Sam Cut Fire Department and he continued work into the 1980s and 90s and then took a little bit of time off. He's also associated um, with the owner of Turner Coaches, if you guys remember that. Um, he returned to work again in 2010. And through that time, he earned a wide variety of certifications and eventually including work towards receiving the rank of captain where he served until his final days. I just wanted to take the time to thank Captain Turner and I know it takes his family supporting him as well uh, for his years of service, but also to thank the Otter Creek Fire Department for a beautiful tribute that they did to him this uh, weekend and just let them know we're all thinking of them. He left quite an impact and, and a space to fill. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm sure they will as well. Any other communications from elected officials? There's, there are none. Moving on, reports from standing committees. There are none. Reports from select committees. There are none. Ordinances relating to appropriations. First up on the agenda is Salary Ordinance 2021-01, ROC 2021-002, Prosecutor's Office. As you recall from last week, that was tabled until the March 9th meeting. Next, Salary Ordinance 2021-02, ROC 2021-004, Auditor's Office. That was withdrawn by the Auditor at our last meeting. Next, Additional Appropriation Ordinance 2021-01, ROC 2020-003, E-Share Asset Forfeiture Fund. That was recently withdrawn by the Sheriff. Next, we have before us Additional Appropriation Ordinance 2021-02, ROC 2021-005, County General Fund, which is what we heard last week regarding uh, COVID relief funds. Are there any questions? comments or concerns about that additional appropriation ordinance request. The final number that we've come up with after posting all the uh, COVID related expenses would be a uh, $2,690,695. So two million six hundred nine thousand six hundred ninety-five dollars. Right. So that's all that we would need to approve tonight. That's what we've got left out of that. What we had left at December thirty-first from the uh, CARES grant it was about thirty thousand less than what we had last week. Mm -hmm. Any questions about that? So I would entertain a motion um, to accept. Uh, I think it's important that uh, we include in the motion the updated number that the auditor just provided us, the $2,690,695. I'd like to make a motion to approve the, um, the COVID relief. Uh, appropriation and the amended amount of two million six hundred ninety thousand six hundred ninety five dollars presented by the auditor this evening. Thank you. 
Mr. President, it, it'd probably be better to amend the appropriation ordinance first and then pass. Does it have to be amended? I think so. I mean, okay. this is the way it's presented, right? All right. We can't just do it in a motion? You can make a motion to amend. Okay. All right. We'll throw another step in here. So, <laughs> All right. Um, since we have a new figure before us from the auditor, and it is a reduction, I'd entertain a motion to amend additional appropriation ordinance 2021-02. Second. 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 Council President, I'll make a motion that we uh, amend the additional appropriation ordinance 2021-02 to two million six hundred ninety thousand six hundred ninety five dollars second so we have a motion on the floor to amend and a second if there are no questions or comments i'd ask for roll call vote please miss wilson aye mr norris aye miss thies aye mr morris aye Ms. swagger aye mr thompson aye mr loudermilk aye motion carries No. Council President, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the amended uh, ordinance 2021-02. Second. So we have a motion on the floor by Councilman Thompson to um, approve the amended ordinance, additional appropriation 2021-02, and a second by <coughs> Councilwoman Wager. Any questions or comments from Council? Having none, I'd ask for roll call vote, please. Ms. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Norris? Aye. Ms. Thies? Aye. Mr. Morris? Aye. Ms. Weger? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Loudermilk? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have before us additional appropriation ordinance 2021-03, ROC 2021-001, Juvenile Justice Center non-reverting fund. Are there any questions or comments from council? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Very good. <laughs>
way to supplement the current general fund budget but non converting user fees, if you will. Um, I also have an email that I keep today from uh, my compliance manager. Total, uh, right now, the uh, outstanding invoice for the county is 42700 So, in addition to the 46 that's sitting in our account, we have 42700 We all know how county government works. It's possible to get there for the process, go through the auditor's office, and the process of state how If you sit back and look, you can see that instead of going to their auditor's office here, it's in their process. So, and you know, you've got a 60 to 90 day turnaround. But this is just what I would call my good man. Just push the So, just to come over there. When I said, Thank you. Questions from council? So, Mr. Lattermill, this will be something that continues to be replenished throughout the year as we continue to have more cases yeah, from. Sorry, yeah. Sorry. Um, this will be something that will continue to be replenished throughout the year as we have more juveniles come in, you're saying, uh, other than that 43000 that's outstanding. Yeah, this is just the first of the month. Okay. Council President. Councilman Thompson. I think, um, Mr. Lattermilk, I think last week we talked about the uh, some of the building repairs, the uh, the doors specifically. Did, go ahead. So, I received two quotes. The first was from the doors itself, and the other was from the labor. After the meeting, I later found out that the total cost of the doors, the labor, So you're asking for 12000 on top of that, correct? Yes. Um, because it's not just the floors, the 12 grand that's for building repairs could go toward the ceiling that's in the investment. When they put the ceiling in, all they did was um, put insulation in. That insulation is, that revenue is what they play basketball, dodgeball, goes through walls, let it hit all the time. It drips, it's falling down. And so there's no, there's high beams.
have you uh, prioritized the items you want done? Have you gotten estimates on either one of those? You had $12,000 in building repair for this year in your budget currently, correct? For the general fund. And the commissioners are the ones that purchase the doors. So do you still have all $12,000? Did the commissioners pay for the doors? Yes. Okay. I don't have anything <coughs> further right now. I had a couple questions. Um, so the dryer and gas line, when was that done? So that's for the gas line? That's for the gas line? Yeah, okay. the gas line. They're running it, you know, two buildings are like the little between them. They're not going to run it exterior and bring it to the bottom. They're running it from the mechanical room around the corner and get to the building. There's a lot of big up there. Has the dryer been paid for already? Do you do you have those invoices? With me? Yeah. So if it was twelve thousand dollars, I mean, did you have an item or a, a line in which you were intending to pay that 
if, if this didn't go through tonight? You said that's twelve thousand dollars for the dryer. Is that right? Who is, and I'm going to bounce around a little bit here, you're talking about an advisory board that oversees a lot of these things, and you talked about the council president being on there. I've never known that to be the case. I wasn't aware you had an advisory board. You, you spoke about an advisory board, right? And you said that the council president sits on the advisory board. I have not known that to be the case ever. Did Mike Morris last year? Okay. Okay. So uh, we, we talked about a lot of things last week, and, and Councilman Thompson's talked about some of those again tonight. Um, I guess from my standpoint, as just one member of the council, what, what I've seen done here historically is when a department head or elected official has a request for additional appropriation, uh, that request is accompanied by quotes and, and actual information about uh, what that appropriation is for. 
and this is a little bit different than what we've done in the past. Um, you know, for me, my biggest my biggest concern for you right now is uh, the safety issues that you're pointing out with that building. Um, you know, it looks like you talked about not being able to get a, a good handle on what the cost would be for that wall and what uh, what the damage actually is there. And I think we talked last week about the ceiling in the rec room just the same. Uh, it looks like there's $9,000 in building repair right now. Maybe we could use some of that to, to get some cost estimates, but for me that would be the largest concern as, as one member of the council because we are the, the body that's going to appropriate those funds and I'd hate for us to be in a position where uh, we have not assessed that damage and something happens between now and then since that's been brought to our attention. So, um, you know, I was hopeful we'd have some sense of what that would look like. Uh, so those are my concerns right now. I'd say very much so, yeah. This money is setting an honorary fund, I think it's going to be the So, I, I'm getting close, Dave, I just got to quote the rest. Uh, uh, the floor and the rest is being done today. Uh, there's going to be four coming in, five out, outside the building. Part of the day room is still the building. The church is being installed. Correct. Well, I think that's some logistics we have to work through, right? I mean, I think uh, last week when you were here, it was kind of the uh, presumption of the council that we would be footing the bill of those three doors. It looks like the commissioners are taking care of that. Um, 
Sure. So the big projects that were still going on, this was more of a they were trying to get the money to get It's another thing too. It's always been, I guess, it's been my experience being involved in government all these years. There's not many times um, department heads give money back to the general fund at the end of the year. I mean, a lot of times they try to spend those funds before the end of the year, so it doesn't go back to the general fund. Not saying you would do that in this case, but a lot of people, a lot of departments will do that. Try to ex expend all those funds prior to the end of the year. Any other thoughts or questions? If there are none, entertain a motion. Mr. President, I'll make a motion that we approve appropriation ordinance 2021-03. We have a motion on the floor by Councilman Morris. It is very second. If there is not a second, then the motion will die. Is there a second to Councilman Morse's motion? President, can I ask a question? If it if that happens, then what's the next step on that for us new people? Would you like to speak on that, Mr. Efner? Well, if there's a second, then you can consider the motion. Vote on the motion. If, there, if there's not a second. Will they be able to bring the request again? Just like I think they would be able to bring it again since it wouldn't have been voted on. If I recall, as long as it's not turned down, then in, in theory it could be resubmitted next month. Okay. If if there's not a second, the motion dies, and the motion just simply dies. We, we didn't act on it. Okay. Is that correct, Mr. Efner? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Does that clear that up for you, Ms. Thies? Yes. I don't think anybody's saying you can never spend that money. I just think, I mean, I, for me, I can't say I can't see what's in everybody else's head. But for me, I would like to see a better plan. I would like to see some some information about what the repairs look like. I mean, we're looking at from what I'm what I'm seeing here in our booklet. For example, the 2021 adopted budget. For institutional supplies was six thousand dollars we're in what a week second week of February the ask is for an additional fifteen thousand I mean that's a big ask with that with I mean well do you know that senior
25 cents a glass of beer. What did I do? I got to the relief money to give him the rest of the money to buy his juice boxes. Without the extra help, people are coming to court and won't be able to go to the bathroom when you're told to. I found a way to use out of county money from the taxpayers to supplement what we could do over there, not get COVID relief money, not ask for money from the general fund, but I've been turned down. My question is, is do you want to plan for me to tell you that we need money by 12 years? So let me let me ask you this. As we're going, I mean, we're talking about historical information here. It looks like for 2021, your requested budget for institutional supplies was six thousand dollars. When would you have requested that for 2021? So when in, in 2020 would you have requested the six thousand dollars for institutional supplies for the 2020 budget? When would that have been? August, July, August? When, when would you made that request for your 2021 budget? So, what, so where does the money, where did that money come from? No, what I'm asking is, your 2021 requested budget for the line item institutional supplies was $6,000. That's what you requested. Yes. Which would have been months after what you're talking about, a March 2020 shortfall. Right. So that's what you requested, and that's what was approved by the council. Absolutely. So... If if it was if it was if it was so if it was such dire straits last year in March, why didn't you ask for an increase then in institutional supplies? It's showing the requested amount six thousand dollars. No, the council refused to hear me. I presented two budgets to this council. The first budget was the general fund budget. The second budget was the budget for the non-referring account to help supplement that general fund. The council did not hear my second budget. They didn't hear it. They didn't act on it. They didn't even speak about it. They didn't. And I spoke about it at the meeting. You can go back and check your web minutes or watch YouTube. But I presented both budgets, threw both budgets in, gave both budgets. And the first budget was the general fund budget. It was acted on. I was spoken about it for 10 minutes. Then after that, general, the non referring fund budget was spoken on. And nobody acted on it. Nobody, nobody said, hey, let's make this new budget for more for next year. <laughs> no one said anything about it. There were no questions. I was given the 10 minutes like everybody else was, sending my way. So what did I do? After the budget, after the budget was not passed, not addressed, and facing that same question I just asked you, Mr. Lavarone, which was, how do I spend the money in that account? It's growing every time we, we, we house detainee. It's growing, and I'm trying to use that money before I use taxpayer money. Guess what? I can't, but you just turn me down. So I'm asking, how am I supposed to spend it? <coughs> and as far as, as far as if I was going to be so short, why didn't I foresee that and then ask for money? I did. Council didn't hear me. What do you mean they didn't hear you? I mean that I came to this microphone that I have two budgets to speak about, and I spoke about both budgets. So you say the council, you mean the, the budget committee? I'm sorry. When you say the council, do you mean the budget committee? Um, whatever meeting I came to speak about the budget, yes. So it was the annual budget committee? Yes, and then during the budget pass process, when they voted on the budget, I was never invited back to talk about it again. They voted on the budget without my presence. So forgive my frustration when I absolutely presented both budgets. I even wiped the year 2020, but that's all you can print, and wrote in the budgets and sent them out. Gave them to the budget committee. They never acted on it. If they would have, there would already be two budgets I'd be working on. The general fund budget, and then the non voting budget. I wouldn't have to come back to the board. I would have already approved that $40,000 back then. But instead, it was never acted. And because it wasn't acted upon, which would have been October, the first thing I did was immediately send a letter to the council or to the auditor's office and ask for this additional appropriation. So that happened in, I think, December. Get me on the calendar as soon as possible. Why well, didn't there were replacements and reorganizations? So I didn't know that. I didn't believe I would be on the calendar until February. So I just, I did as quick as I could, realizing that we would need that money. 
Council President. My notes indicated the budget for the non-reverting fund was passed. My notes indicate that the budget for the non-reverting fund was passed. She said her notes indicate that the budget for the non-reverting fund had passed. That's what she just said. It was it was passed at thirty thousand dollar what was as you requested. I think that's part of the confusion. So maybe I, you know, told me that any type of budget it looks like, from what I see, we it, 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 what I'm seeing, provided I'm looking at this correctly, and I think that I am, in, in your general fund budget, for institutional supplies, for example, it's twenty-one six hundred, and then six thousand out of non-reverting fund. You don't know anybody who works in that office. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't know anybody who works in that office has information like that. There's a lot of confusion. Why everybody can't understand anything. And so the money's there. I didn't receive any information from anyone. Not the council, not the administrator, not the governor, not anybody saying that there was a second budget that was passed for 30 minutes. The only one I thought that was ever acted upon was the only one. Well, I don't, I don't know that that burden's on the council to tell you that People that's passed. We do it in a public meeting. meeting. And then you get your, I'm sure you get a copy of your budget at some point. But, but regardless of that, I st as one council person, I still, since you brought to light potential safety issues at the center, I would still like for us to get that remedied as quickly as possible. I just don't want to be in a position where we wish we'd done something quicker. So we had a motion on the floor. And it didn't get a second. There's no no, no second. Yeah. So we're not going to act on it anyway. Right. Okay. Fair enough? Yeah. All right. And did you, yeah, anytime you want me to come back to let you know what was going on? Okay. Sounds great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Loudermilk, I would suggest you include the commissioners on that email as well. Okay. Next. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, moving on. We have additional appropriation. Ordinance 2021-04, ROC 2021-006, Honey Creek Fire Protection District. Uh, we heard uh, the request last week um, and the need that Honey Creek has for additional equipment. Are there any questions Done. or comments? No. I think we're good. Yeah. I think we're in good shape. David. Well, I'm scared of making motion. So we, <laughs> we, <laughs> God, you guys. David, how President Loudermill, I make a motion that okay. we um, do the funds, the additional appropriation for the Honey Creek Fire Department. Okay. I will second that motion. So we have a motion on the floor from Councilman Norris. To approve additional appropriation ordinance 2021-04, Honey Creek Fire Protection District. A second by Councilman Wager. If there are no questions or comments, I would ask for roll call vote, please. Ms. Wilson? Aye. Mr. Norris? Aye. Ms. Thies? Aye. Mr. Morris? Aye. Ms. Wager? Aye. Mr. Thompson? Aye. Mr. Loudermill? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next, we have additional appropriation ordinance 2021-05, ROC 2021-004, auditor's office. It was um, withdrawn last week by the auditor. It was tied to the previous withdrawal that we spoke about. Uh, next, reduction appropriation ordinance 2021-01, ROC 2021-002, prosecutor's office. That, like the previous prosecutor's office a request, was tabled until March 9th. Uh, lastly, ordinance establishing sex and violent offender, violent crime offender fees and fund was a late submission. We will hear that in March. Uh, next, we have honorary resolutions. There are none. And lastly, we have some of the final appointments. So the Emergency Management Advisory Council will be Councilwoman Wilson, a one-year term that will expire December 31st, 2021. Uh, Pre-Disaster Mitigation Committee is the Council President, one-year term. That would be Councilman Loudermilk, December 31st, 2021, expiration. Local Emergency Planning Commission, one-year term. Councilman Norris, expiration of term, December 31st, 2021. Building Inspection Advisory Board, 